thank you very much, and, and thank you very much for having me here anyway, because it's been an eye-opener, the richness, the breadth, the, the textures of what I've heard. It actually makes me wonder, I have a fascinating life. I spend my life thinking about other people's problems, but what I think I keep on asking myself here today, where have I been? You know, because actually there's so much more, and, and, and that's wonderful. Um, now, let me just work out how I'm going to do this. Right, okay. Um, are I going the right way? Yes, I am. Yeah. Um, I, I missed the very start of the conference today, and I apologise for that, but the railways got the better of me. Uh, but I don't know what you were told about uh, Horizon 2020, but if you don't know already, you should know now, there are three key pillars. And what I want to do is just burrow down a bit into the third of the pillars, the societal challenges pillar, and I'm going to burrow down further from that to talk about the transport aspect of that. Um, it's lots of money. It's an enormous sum of money. For those of you who don't automatically translate your euros into sterling, I reckon that's about 65 billion sterlings worth of, of money, which isn't bad for anything. Uh, now, of course, that's not all for societal challenges. Uh, societal challenges uh, comes in there uh, with about um, 25 um, billion, I guess. Yeah, about 25 billion, something like that. Um, now, uh, what I think one needs to do is, is think of the societal pet challenges around those uh, seven pillars. And I say, I'm going to burrow down, so acknowledging the seven pillars, or the seven uh, bits of societal challenges, I'm going to talk about the smart, green, and integrated transport uh, bit of it. Um, because that seems to me to not only, from my point of view, be very interesting, but also to cast light generally on the Commission's approach to funding research and innovation work in, in this area. And therefore, I hope what I go on to say will have relevance to you who may not be so interested in transport things, but may be looking at the societal challenges money uh, for your own uh, area uh, of interest. Uh, I said just now, there was something like 2.5 billion share for transport. Transport accounts for 8% of the total societal challenges budget, so about 2.5 billion over the period 2014 to 2020. But we need to do some decoding. I mean, what really is meant by this phrase, smart, green, and integrated transport? <coughs> I suppose the underlying challenges can be boiled down into a number of things, which I've tried to do here. It's about resource efficiency. It's about being environmentally friendly. It's about having a transport system that is safe, but almost more important, is seamless. Think of end-to-end -end journeys. Don't think of yourself as a bus user or a road user or an airline user. You want to think about the totality of the journey. And therein lies a clue, because once you start to think outside operational modes, once you think seamlessly, you're beginning to touch on the cross-cutting issues, issues like ticketing, which you're going to hear more about in a moment, the cross-cutting issues that I think may be the big drivers of the money, of getting your hands on the money available in, in the future. And then this important one, for the benefit of, at least I think it's important, but again, it's slightly Euro-speak, is for the benefit of citizens, economy, and society. And what you're going to hear in a moment is alleged to be what the citizens themselves want. But that is Brussels come Strasbourg, Eurospeak, not to be dismissed, but not to be taken too literally, perhaps. We'll see. Um, now, I indicated just now, thinking seamlessly, for example, requires a holistic approach, a cross-modal approach, trying to think uh, about those cross-cutting themes. And that's, that's clearly important to them. But another really important bit to the European Commission is, understandably, the way that research and innovation spending needs to resonate with European policy requirements. So anyone who's seriously interested in extracting money in this area, I think, needs to go back to the texts, the white papers, the uh, communications, the decisions, and so on that come out of the Commission, because only if you can state your, your um, acquis, your, 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 your legislative and policy paper precedents, do you really stand a chance, I think, of tapping into this money? Come back to getting again. Again. I mentioned focusing on societal challenges, gender issues, equality issues, I mean, deeply important in, in, in European funding allocation. 
And having said that, also this quasi-ideological position, the free market, the, free, the, 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 the liberal market economy position of reflecting, uh, dealing with competitiveness. But I want to pull out just one of them, which is the accommodating EU policy requirements and try and show you one of the sort of areas I think is quite tricky, but area which may actually hold a key to quite a lot of research potential. Um, I think from my point of view, in the transport field, one needs to start with the white paper that the European Commission published in 2011, having consulted the member states, having consulted the parliament, having consulted social partners and so on, white paper on transport policy. Every 10 years, there's a major policy paper comes out. It's revised at about the year five, but every 10 years, a new one comes out. In 2011, a very important transport white paper came out. And the focus of it was the need to have a real reduction a real reduction of something like 60% on 1998 levels in carbon emissions or, or in, 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 in noxious emissions, and to reduce the great dependence that there clearly is in Europe on imported energy sources. But there was another element to it too, a sort of prescriptive element, which was we can't do this by reducing people's ability to travel. We must accept that in a modern society, people's mobility is very, very important. It's seen particularly by the new member state people, the people particularly from Central and Eastern Europe who used not to be part of the EU, that's seen as part of the, 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 the resistance to command interventions, to sort of state direction saying, thou shalt not, is very great indeed. And therefore, Vice President Kalas, the transport commissioner, who is an Estonian, believes absolutely fundamentally you cannot restrain people's desire or need or wish or aspiration or whatever to travel. You have to accept that mobility is important. Now, a number of, a great number of well thought through issues came out and I've listed some of the key ones at the bottom. The elimination of conventionally fueled vehicles in cities by 2050. 40% uh, use of sustainable low carbon fuels in aviation. Shipping emissions cuts. And from my particular perspective of rail, the very important one that for medium distance journeys, journeys of roughly 300 kilometers, 200 miles sort of thing, uh, more than half of passenger and freight ton or passenger kilometers will be by rail. So rail moves from having a sort of 10 to 15% share to a rather more than 50% share. When you factor in growth, natural economic growth, you're talking about a 10 to 15 fold increase in the number of passenger kilometers or ton kilometers done by rail. And that is a major, major thing. The British at the moment are trumpeting because since privatization, the number of rail passenger kilometers has doubled. We're talking about that number going up 15 fold. And that obviously has enormous implications. How can you achieve that? Now, there may be a flaw in all this argument. Uh, I'm not entirely sure, although I'm on the side of public transport. Um, I don't know whether it's going to be really possible to make public transport the mode of choice. Can you envisage a world, because certainly people in the Commission are envisaging it now, of automated, electrified highways? where you sit in your car and you're basically taken there with much higher traffic densities than we can envisage at the moment. Do you really need railways? Do you really need public transport if you've got electrified motorways, if you've got uh, ITS driving, you're, you're driving you around as you sit in your own privacy? And then the, the Commission's insistence on ruling out command economy measures to force the change. What are the implications there? Well, to me, there's one very clear implication. And that is, if you can't force people to use public transport, you have to make public transport sufficiently attractive to become the mode of choice. And that's an enormous challenge. It's what I call a 30 trillion euro challenge. That's the sort of money, the order of, you know, give or take another 30 trillion, that, or, or to add another 30 trillion. It's, it's between, between 30 and 60 trillion euros of investment is going to be needed in, in the best judgments I know of to achieve that over the next 30, 30, 40 years. Now, I think I'm up for time, aren't I? Yes. Uh, 
I was going to go and talk about these, these tensions. Uh, let's take HS2 as, as oh, well, uh, let's take HS2 as, as, as the prime example of the tension. On the one hand, you've got the desire for much greater speed and the government's attempt to sell HS2 originally because it enabled you to get from London to Birmingham in 40 minutes or whatever it was, 35 minutes, and Manchester in an hour or whatever it is. And on the other hand, you've got people's needs. People want a seat on a train, they want a seat on an affordable train, they want to go at times they want to go, and all that sort of thing. And throughout this, you've got this fascinating tension, I think, between what I would call technology push and, and market pull. So how do you get to that stage where you can justify that 30 trillion euros or perhaps 60 trillion euros of investment? I said just now that public transport, if it's to succeed, has to be turned into the mode of choice. Just picking up from, from uh, what Victoria was talking about this morning, I mean, I'd be delighted if public transport operators got as far as uh, sensing and responding in terms of marketing because at the moment, I don't think any of us would feel, who know public transport, that public transport operators are very good at sensing and responding user needs. They've got to understand user needs. They need satisfied users, because if you've got satisfied users, firstly, people will migrate to public transport, but secondly, people will give the political support to the politicians who need to make the decisions to release that 30 trillion that I believe is required. And once you get the funding, then of course you get more satisfaction. So the real challenge in my mind is to get a cultural shift both within the transport sector but also in the attitudes of the academic research community who do much to support the work of the transport sector in moving forward. So we begin to think much more in terms of satisfying potential user need, whether the needs of passengers or of freight forwarders. So there's the challenge. There's a lot of money, as I said, whether it's achievable or not, I think time will tell. But having listened today, I think there may be some potential here. Thank you very much indeed.